Hi everyone, thank you for taking the time to come and visit my talk. I hope you've had a great day yesterday already with the first few sessions. Uh, I know I did. Um, excited to um, talk, in, talk in to you about today about my personal story of going from keyword to vector um, and how it might also be at one point your personal story. Um, before we start, I want to ask the audience, how, raise of hands, how many people here work in search? Uh, all right, okay. Enough people. Well, I hope at the end all of you are convinced that the way to vector is the, is the next step for you. How many of you are already working with vector search or something with vectors? Uh, half, okay. So we have the other half to convince. Um, my name is Bayern Vorbach. I'm head of sales engineering at WeV8. Um, and like I said, today I want to take you through my personal journey of how I got there. Um, some of the uh, projects that I've been working on over the last few years, uh, not so much with WeV8 because I only joined a year ago. Um, but in keyword search, um, the lessons learned, some of the pains I experienced uh, that well, most of you probably also experienced, um, and then get to a conclusion of how I joined WeV8. Um, there will be questions to the audience, and you will have to participate. Um, but don't stress. You can earn some of our vintage socks. I don't know. You've probably seen all the goodies downstairs, but we actually have some old school socks that were last year's editions. Uh, we V8 employees are not allowed to participate, uh, even though you joined probably after these socks were a thing. Uh, too bad. Um, so to start, um, this is not going to be the first question, where is this or what is this place? Uh, because I don't think any of you will know it. Um, but this is sort of my origin story of where I started. So um, I was studying software engineering and did an internship in this building. And in this building, there were a few of my colleagues that were super interested in search. Uh, they were doing Lucene and Solar um, um, consultancy and helping companies um, yeah, with a lot of their search problems. Um, while I was switching from an internship into a steady job at that place, um, most of those people left. And that brings us to our first question where you can earn sucks. So for the first person to answer, who knows which company this is, company this is nowadays? You know, anyone. Sorry. Elastic, yes. So, nice, Tom. <laughs> I think you already had the socks, but they were not, they were not yet. Well, we'll see. So, in this building, there were a few of my old colleagues that started Search Workings, and Search Workings was a consultancy company. Uh, they brought in Shai uh, from Israel, and they started Elastic. So, in the same building where I was sort of like figuring out what I wanted to do with my personal journey in software engineering, uh, Elastic Search was starting. And Back in 2012, but 2013, while I was there, um, yeah, I was super interested in that. And my mentor sort of that hired me from the internship and, and the, the work after said, if you don't know where you want to go with your development skills, why not do something with search? You have these guys right here. The technique seems like it could be something. Well, he was sort of a visionary because look at what Elastic is nowadays. I think everyone here in the room has either touched it or has played around with it or is maybe even running it in production. Um, but back in 2012, 2013, I started with the basics. So I was still learning programming, but search at the same time. Um, started with Elasticsearch 019.3. Uh, had to learn a bit of Lucene, because yeah, if you want to learn Elastic properly, you have to know what the basis is. Um, and I started with building an e-commerce sample app. Well, for all the people that didn't raise their hands um, when I asked the question, who's working in search, uh, if you don't work in search yet, that is my recommendation for a good start if you want to play around. Back in the days, it was pretty hard to find good data sets in 2012. Um, but nowadays, you can use large language models to, to generate complete uh, e-commerce data sets if you'd like. Um, so the barrier to getting started is a lot easier uh, right now, or is a lot lower. So I started with an e-commerce sample app, did some, because it contains all the features you yeah, want from a search engine. You have facets, you have uh, filters, sorting, pagination, search as you type. Um, it really encompasses everything to, uh, to get started. And back in this time, I was also still under the impression that um, dashboards in VR was going to be the future. Uh, so we had a hackathon, the first development kit, one of Oculus, and I was like, wow, what if we could see Kibana in 3D? What if you could monitor, monitor your dashboards with a VR? Well, 10 years later, still didn't really happen. Maybe now with the Apple Vision Pro. Um, but yeah, you need a lot of money for that. So probably not good enough to watch your Kibana dashboards. Um, but fast forward three years later, I learned a lot of programming, and I did more in search, and did some small projects on the side. Um, does anyone know here, Bol.com? 
<laughs> there are some bold.com people in the room. Um, so this was sort of my first big project, also in e-commerce. So it was good that I started with the e-commerce sample app. Um, but bold.com is sort of what the Amazon is in the US. Bold.com is in the Netherlands. People in the Netherlands love bold.com. Um, I love bold.com, not just because I helped build search at one point, but uh, it's just great. It's a great company, and it's like a very nice experience on, on the site. Um, there's a lot of lessons learned during this time at my time at bold.com. And the main thing here was this. Now, this is a wine glass, right? Like, it's pretty straightforward. But in Dutch, this is a little bit different, because you have wine glass, um, or you have wine glass. Now, doesn't doesn't seem too weird, but which of these two sort of is correct? Um, because you can spell the word, and there's actually one official spelling, but people use both. And we try to optimize search for if someone types wine glass or wine glass with a space, we want to have the same products. Um, but we noticed that users were actually trying to search with both. So around 52% of people used the proper term, whereas 48% uh, did not. And this was sort of a first lesson that even though you can build a perfect search for a perfect lexical way, users are not perfect, and users will make typos, and users expect the same results, and also business expect the same results for these kind of cases. Um, but that's not where it stopped, because in, yeah, we have a wine glass, but we have wine glasses, we have small version wine glasses, and that turns into like all of these different permutations of terms. And it just becomes like mind-blowing how to match all of this into one product or to one term. That turned into sort of a never-ending story of managing synonyms because we, yeah, how do we fix this? We have content, uh, we have user input, they all need to end up at the same point, so let's just make a synonym. So we had this massive rule of like having these words, all of them revert to the word wine glass. It's great, but it's not really the purpose of synonyms, because a synonym is a different way of writing something, and we were sort of misusing synonyms uh, in order to fix matching. So during that time in 2016, 2018, while I was helping out there, I felt the pain of managing search. Um, day in, day out, we were figuring out how to build these synonyms, how to make sure that when a user searches something, that we can actually match that back to the products that we have. Um, Bold.com is a plaza, or is a platform where people and companies can sell their own products. So we didn't even control the content, or at least back then, there was not a lot of rules or ways to actually fix that content um, so that we can actually match the user input. So users don't know how content is indexed. Um, users will make typos. Um, and on the other hand, we ha need to have an algorithm that like, points everything to the same space. That is, was most of the time at one point a lot of the work, trying to match this input and matching it back to products. Synonyms are not perfect. We misuse synonyms, and I saw some nods and laughs because I think a lot of people have seen this, that you're, how to fix this? Can we fix stemming? Well, let's just make an overwrite, or let's just add a synonym. Um, but we're actually misusing these kind of synonyms to, to sort of fix the matching, uh, which is not the best way. Because in the end, when we see, when we look at these results, but also when we look at the content and when we look at the user input, we can see that these things mean the same. Semantically, they mean the same. Um, so this was sort of the first time where I really noticed, like, okay, you really need to spend a lot of time learning Elasticsearch tokenizes, analyzes, etc., in order to match and match this content, even though we understand that these are the same things. And ranking is difficult, because if you have one query to rule them all, how do you differentiate between different categories? Um, when is it match in title more important than in description? Um, we all had to manage boosts and tune a little bit here, tune a little bit there, and then one category falls over. Um, so a lot of these questions popped up, like, do we need to split up separate queries? And this was sort of the first time where I noticed, like, we need a better way to figure out whether search actually improves. And yesterday, um, Yo mentioned during his talk the looks good to me at 10 metric. Uh, that was the only metric we had in the beginning. Just there are type wine glass and see if we saw the correct wine glasses popping up. And we did that with a sort of top 20 queries just to validate if our new engine would actually improve results. But that's only fixing the head. You're not even looking at the tail. Um, so around 2018, I figured this needs to be improved. This needs to be better. And that was sort of my first step into machine learning. Um, so in 2018, I gave a talk after a lot of investigation on doing learning to rank, because I thought learning to rank, that's the, that's the way forward. That's, that's how we can fix things. Um, 
it wasn't really because it was a lot of investment, there's a lot of time needed. I don't know how many people have tried learning to rank. How many people are running learning to rank successfully in production? Okay, yeah, <laughs> the meta rank guys are here. That, like, that makes it a hard question to answer. But uh, in general, though, like, uh, we've tried and we've tried and we spent a lot of time of like, uh, trying to get learning to rank to work. Um, but it was a huge investment for not always a fruitful outcome. All right, fast forward one year later. Um, I was working, uh, after my period at Bull.com, I switched to Albert Heijn, which is the uh, largest supermarket chain in the Netherlands. And there we came in, uh, or I came in as a consultant to help out with one problem. And you can see the sock in the top right, and Albert Heijn guys are not allowed to participate in this. But what is wrong with this search page? Because we're searching for M&Ms, and first person to shout out, what is wrong on this page? Who said X first here? Yeah, correct. <clears throat> but do you also know why there's eggs? Why are, why are there eggs here on spot number two? That's the second paragraph. Tokenization. Um, there was an initial version of search which was built on Endeka, and I came in to help out transition that to, uh, or together with actually some of the people here, to transition this to Elasticsearch. And one of the things that we've learned over the years is like tokenization is important, semic is important, all of these analyzes are important. But when you look at the term M&Ms, it's weird that you get eggs. Instead, we would rather have other things to be returned that like, might help the user buy other things instead for upselling. Um, so what we did is we came in, we helped out, and we changed the algorithm, and we got to a perfect list of M&Ms. Fix, right? Now, because one does not simply change these results, because business stopped, st stopped selling eggs when people search for M&Ms. Which is a, one of the other weird business rules that you at one point figure out is you can't just change search results because then business looks at like upselling and it sees, hey, we're missing out on money. So what did we do? Instead, we sort of said, okay, let's fix the matching first and then think about different ways and different ways to do this upselling. So we fixed the search, uh, we fixed the matching to a proper, proper matching and then started thinking about, let's see if we can actually instead return Skittles uh, when someone searches for M&Ms. But that brings up another point, like how do we make that relationship between M&Ms and Skittles? How, does, how do we know? Or do we need to add that to the content? Do we need to add keywords? Semantically, we know it's sort of in the same area because it's all candy. Um, so what if we could do something with recommendation algorithms? It was a lot of investment. I think we did quite a lot of things, um, but it was not an easy way to get started in this. Other questions that came up is like, how good is our ranking model? And that was sort of for me during this time, like how can we actually prove that when we change something in search, that things get better? Um, how do we classify intent? If a user adds a tomato and a cucumber to their shopping cart, they're probably gonna make a salad. Um, if we know that, maybe we can already start recommending items. And this was sort of a time where for me personally, I started to figure out we need to find a better way to understand what the user is doing on our website, what he's searching on. Can we leverage different types of information of how the user interacts with our website to recommend or to improve search results? Can we extract filters from queries? Uh, another part like, that led me into sort of machine learning side of like, can we actually extract sort of filters from, um, uh, from the query? So if we can extract a category from it, we can do sort of more of a browse experience. So we can actually change the UX and give people another experience, and the user will know, like, hey, this website actually understands what I'm searching for. Um, one of the many pitfalls of like, my journey up until this point is that everyone came in, it's like, we have search, um, but we actually use Google to search our own website. So we type in Google what I want to find with our website in it, and that, that works. One of the ten things that was pretty hard as a search consultant is that you come in and people, you ask people, how do you want your search to work? And they say, like Google's. Um, which was impossible because Google already started doing vector search, but didn't open that to everyone else. So we had to build that ourselves. We had to think about ways to sort of fix this matching and fix this for everyone. While we were working sort of on these kind of things at Albert Heijn, um, there was someone else that came up um, that came in at Albert Heijn and said, hey, I have this new tool and I can return Pepsi results when you search for Coca-Cola. It's like, why, why would I want that? Like, yeah, either a Pepsi guy or a Coca-Cola guy, right? Like, who don't really need to have to be, get returned both? But the main thing here is, because you see the sock, does anyone know who this guy is? 
check. That's a little bit far in the back, so if we, someone can pass it along. Oh, there. Nice. Bob von Lett, um, back then founder of Semi Technologies, um, right now founder and CEO of VV8. And uh, I was classified with the task of checking whether VV8 would be a good fit for Albert Heijn. Um, we tried it out, we played around with it, and figured, no, it's actually not good enough at all. Like, the concept is nice, but it actually doesn't really work. Um, and this sort of triggered two things. One, for me, it was a nice because I got to know Bob. Bob was a nice guy. We kept in touch over the years. Um, and the other part is, like, the semantic matching between Pepsi and Coca-Cola. We all know that these two things are related. In the store, they are next to each other. And I didn't have to create synonyms. I didn't have to create extra rules to sort of bring these things together. I didn't have to fix the content. It just worked. And that was interesting. So we kept in touch. The technology wasn't good enough, but technology evolves over time. Uh, my personal skills evolved over time. And that resulted in 2022 uh, that I had a talk with Bob. He's like, do you want to come and join? Because I think your experience in keyword search can actually help us drive better vector search uh, within Weaviate. So 2022, um, I joined, very happy, got started, and started working at Weaviate. Well, you've already seen this downstairs. You, I don't think you could have missed it over the last few days to, to either hear about Weaviate, see about Weaviate, uh, especially with the new balloons today. I don't know if you've seen them. You must have. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that sort of brings me to sort of a point in my career where I was like, okay, we now really have these two different things. So we have keyword search, the things that I've been doing for nine years in, nine year, nine years in a row, which uses sort of inverted index, it's matching on terms, it's a lot of work to get right, uh, a lot of orchestration, a lot of management, a lot of people have to be involved in order to get good search results. And on the other side, we have vector search, which uses machine learning, um, which does more of the semantic matching, but it has extra capabilities as well because with inverted index, you can't really match on images or on videos or on shopping carts or anything that you could potentially vectorize. Um, and it allows for new types of interactions because now all of a sudden we can do QA and we can like, make new interactions on our website all powered by sort of one engine. So it's nice to have these sort of two worlds next to each other, but what if I told you you can have both? Um, and that's sort of like one of the things that uh, we started on when I joined at Weaviate, 8 and it's a feature that we call hybrid search. And hybrid search is sort of the best combination of both worlds because we know that when we actually search on something uh, in an e-commerce setting, for instance, if a user searches on a product name, um, semantic matching might not always bring the exact product that you want on top because it's semantic matching, it's sort of nearest neighbor, so it's not always going to be perfect. But if a user, as a user, if I have a match on the exact title and it's on the third spot, I, I think it's a wrong search result or it's a wrong list because that needs to be on the first place. And that's sort of what hybrid search solves, uh, or it's one of the aspects that hybrid search solves. Because another point is machine learning models are trained on a specific set of data. But what if you actually you have users that search on terms that were not in your training data? then you will not get correct vectors, you will not get correct results, and hybrid search will also fix that. So you can either go into the realm of fine-tuning models to make sure that all of your user queries are part of the training data, or you can leverage something like hybrid search, where you still have all of these lessons and all of this technology and evolve um, um, development that's been done over the years and combine the two. So we currently use uh, reciprocal rank fusion to merge these results, um, because you can imagine they're two different systems. Uh, they both have different scoring algorithms. Um, so they produce different scores. Um, but we're working on sort of a new feature there for doing relative score fusion, which will actually improve results by a lot more. So we're constantly developing on this hybrid search uh, because we noticed that a lot of our users are currently very happy using it. Um, it supports advanced filtering, so you can actually do anything that you were doing before uh, in your keyword search engine um, and easily migrate that to um, a solution like Weaviate. This would actually solve also the issue with the our wine glass, because wine glass, all of these terms, all of these permutations that you saw before can just be solved with one query. But with hybrid, we can actually make the distinction between a single wine glass or a group of wine glasses. So that was sort of my 10 years in 15 minutes or 20 minutes even. Uh, it was a way too short amount of time to actually show you a lot more of that. Um, but I'm interested to see uh, what your personal journey will be and how you will transition from keyword to vector. 
if you want to connect with us, uh, we're downstairs. We have a lot of t-shirts left. So if you need a t-shirt, they're Berlin Buzzwords editions. I don't think we're going to re-give them next year because the year is on it. Um, we might scratch that off. I don't know. Um, but connect with us uh, if you want to know more. Uh, if you want to see a demo, um, come to me afterwards. And here are some references. So we have uh, a blog post explaining this hybrid search more in detail. Um, on our roadmap, you can see more features that are coming up within hybrid search. Uh, a couple of years ago, when I first had the opportunity to sort of speak at Berlin Buzzwords in combination with Haystack, it was COVID, so I was doing that from home, um, where I shared sort of the 10 lessons that I learned over the last 10 years together with my co uh, ex-colleague Getro. Um, so if you want to know about a few more things, like on the business side of things, or analytics side of things, or content side of things, uh, make sure to rewatch that one. And then if you don't know anything about vector search yet, then I don't think everyone knows <laughs> something about vector embeddings by now, so I didn't decide to include any of that. But if you want to read more on that and how we do that, um, you can read this blog. I'll leave it up for one more sec. Yeah, all right. And are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Byron. <laughs> we do have time for... Uh, Maybe one, 1.5 very quick questions. And we have one, one pair of socks left, so <laughs> it needs to be a good question. Uh -huh. Are you sure? Wait for a microphone. Hello. Uh, so first of all, the search team of Ball.com sends their regards, <laughs> and we still love you, Byron. Uh, but the question is, could you share maybe some general experiences and learnings that you have from the vector search? Yeah, so I think in the beginning, like I said, when, when I first saw Vector Search, when, when Bob came to uh, Albert Heijn and, and, and showed me the techniques, it was like, it wasn't really good because we used the Dutch language model. And I think one of the issues with Dutch languages is that no one really cares to really create good proper machine learning model that like creates perfect embeddings for the Dutch language. Um, so that was a lot of experience for me where I was like, Vector Search actually doesn't really work because it doesn't really get the meaning and it doesn't really allow me to match on a single word really well. But with the advancements and developments of uh, machine learning models over the, year, over the last year already alone, we now have models that can be multilingual, that are very good in Dutch as well. And we can see that the quality improves a lot. Um, but still, there are certain areas where it's not always perfect, uh, which is one of the reasons why we're investing in this hybrid search part, because we really feel like giving people the option to do both uh, will allow them to make these better, um, uh, better experiences for their users. Um, Another part is, is that it kind of is a transition, right? Like, so if you're familiar with search and you're familiar with keyword search, switching to vector search is a little bit of a different world. Things work a little bit different. It's a little different to manage. Um, but I think it's m getting more and more close to like, how tools like an Elasticsearch is doing, for instance. They are also adding t uh, f vector search on top. So we see that, I think in general, the whole industry sort of sees that vector search is here to stay. And for me, a reason to specifically join Weaviate is because I think we're the best at doing vector search. We have one more question here. Thanks, uh, really nice talk. Uh, so what's your approach to actually not showing not relevant results? Yeah, so that's a good question. So uh, we have, of course, uh, distance calculations or certainty calculations um, where you can at one point have a sort of cutoff threshold. It's so the same with BM25. If you do an OR query with all the words, at one point, documents that just contain one word, or if it contains somewhere in the description, you also have to figure out like, how to cut these out. Um, there, you could like, opt for going for, so if you know your machine learning model well, that, the one that you're using, you know at one point where is this point in cutoff in scores where we just say, OK, don't return any results anymore. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Um, another way would be to. Um, run offline evaluation on like, uh, inf analytics data that you've already gathered before. So if you already have a keyword search-based system, for instance, or if you already have a search engine running, you already know that for certain uh, um, user queries, there are no clicks or there are no interactions with certain documents. And that's also a way to in change your ranking, so to actually just push those documents down that are irrelevant, uh, because no one is going to look further than page two uh, on your search results. I hope that answers your questions a little bit. Okay, so we thank Byron one more time. <laughs>